All right, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today. We thank God for each of you. It's hard to believe this is the last official chapel, um, not counting seniors chapel at the end of the week, um, but we are looking forward to worshiping the Lord together today. Uh, we're blessed today to have our admissions director, our student pastor at East Barberville Baptist Church as our speaker in chapel, and he is no stranger to Clear Creek. I'll have to throw that out there. I know y'all are always excited when we use that phrase, but uh, we pray for Brother Taylor Haley today as he comes to preach uh, to us and to feed us from the Word of God. He is a great expositor of the Word, and so <clears throat> I am thankful that he serves on staff with me at East Barberville Baptist Church. And uh, my son, or my children, I should say, my son is in the teenage ministry, uh, rooted with uh, our students under Brother Taylor's preaching and teaching, and then my two youngest are in our Kingdom Clubs ministry that he leads and facilitates as well. And so we're seeing a lot of growth there, seeing impacts in the lives of students and uh, their families, and we rejoice in that. Unspoken prayer request, show of hands. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, the beauty of it. I thank you for those that are here today in this room, those that are joining us online as well. We pray that you pour out your spirit upon us today, that we could worship you in spirit and truth, position your gifting. Lord, within the man of God who will come to break the bread of life today, we pray that you would just speak through him. Give us our hearts and, and minds to receive your word as you speak from heaven here today. Lord, we pray that you would uh, help us to have a sacrifice of praise on our lips. Lord, I pray for every need represented by every hand that you would move and work as only you can in each situation, each circumstance. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, Clear Creek. Let's stand together and worship our Savior. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word what more can he say than to you he has said to you who for refuge to jesus has fled Fear not, he is with us, so be not dismayed, for he is our God, our sustainer and strength. He'll be our defender and cause us to stand, upheld by his mercy, almighty hand. And how firm our how sure our salvation and we will not be shaken Jesus firm foundation the soul that is trusting in Jesus as Lord will press on enduring the darkest of storms and no even hell should it never to shake he'll never no never no never forsake he'll never no never no never forsake how firm our how sure our salvation and we will not be shaken Jesus firm foundation age to age he stands
Jesus' firm foundation. Jesus' firm foundation. Jesus' firm foundation. foundation. Amen. Give the Lord praise. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong. In the Savior's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. sound oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless stand before the throne and now I invite you all during this time of prayer sitting standing or coming to the altar Let us petition our Lord and go boldly before his throne.
tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to Saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh. trust him more and oh how sweet to trust in Jesus just to trust his cleansing blood just in simple faith to plunge me Need the healing, cleansing blood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I prune him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. And yes, it's sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease. Just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him. Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. And I'm so glad I learned to trust Him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that Thou art with me, will be with me to the end. And Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more. Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust in voices only. More. And Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I broom him. Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more.
most gracious Heavenly Father, how I pray we truly believe what we just sang. Lord, that we do long to trust you more. And God, as I know, as this is finals week for seniors and then the rest of the classes will there have their finals next week. Lord, I pray that they're trusting you for your provision to cross the finish line. God, it's easy for us to say, ah, oh, we're almost there. Just throw our hands up. Whatever will be, will be. But God, we don't need to have that attitude. You say to finish the race, to complete it, so that one day when we finish the ultimate race of life, we will hear, well done good and faithful servant. And so, Lord, I thank you for each of these individuals here today. And Lord, I thank you for this time of worship through music. And now as we enter into worship through your word, be with Brother Taylor and let him bring that word fresh and anew for all of us to hear this morning. In Jesus' holy and precious name, I pray this. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Nix, for that. <coughs> <clears throat> I agree with uh, Brother Jared Stiles when it comes to worship. A worship team can either elevate you up to a mountaintop or they can dig you a ditch to get out of. And I am so thankful for Dr. Nix's leadership, and he always has us on the mountain top. And so thank you for that, Dr. Nix. Always enjoy your leadership with the worship team. Uh, I went ahead and I warned a few people if you were going to skip a chapel, it should have been today. But too late, you've been buzzed in, we see you, you cannot leave, you're trapped, good luck, you're mine until at least 11.50. Nobody? Oh, okay, you're good with it, okay, cool, 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 <coughs> awesome, awesome. Uh, I do want to invite you, if you have a copy of God's Word, to go to the book of First Peter in the New Testament, First Peter, and we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 21, book of First Peter, chapter 1, verses 13 through through 21. It is always a blessing and a joy to stand in this pulpit uh, with you all. And I have mixed emotions every time I stand up in this pulpit for a couple of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I remember when I preached my senior chapel here, I remember my time here as a student. It's an emotional uh, situation, but I also feel the weight of preaching in this pulpit, knowing that so many great men of God have stood here before me with higher pedigrees, with more uh, intellectual uh, abilities with uh, better diction, better vocabulary than me. And uh, I feel the weight of the responsibility of what I'm about to do here. But I remember it is not about me. It is not about you. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. And so today, all I seek to do with you all is to elevate the word of God, to make him known and to preach God's word. <laughs> and before I read uh, chapter one, verses 13 through 21, I want to make sure that you all know this. I believe in God. God's word. You see, I don't just believe about God's word. I don't think this is just a book that contains God's word. You see, I believe this is God's word. And with that in mind, I believe that this word is inspired. I believe God is the divine author. While the hands of man may have put ink to paper, God is the divine author of this book, literally breathed out in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. And not only is it inspired, folks, I believe it is inerrant. I believe from Genesis 1 all the way to the end of Revelation that you will not find an error in this book. I believe it's infallible. I do not believe it has the possibility to contain errors. This is, book is the foundation of my faith. It is all that I have, nothing more. And with that in mind, I invite you as we look to God's word, we are going to preach on this subject today, the response of the redeemed. The response of the redeemed. Beginning in chapter 1, verse 13, I'm reading from the CSB uh, translation. Peter writes to his audience, Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded, and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. But as the one who has called you is holy, you are also to be holy in all of your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. <laughs> if you appeal to the Father who judges impartially according to each one's work, you are to conduct 
conduct yourselves in reverence during your time living as strangers. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but get this, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Uh, Pray with me as we dig in to see what God has for us in his word. Father, I thank you for another day. We get to gather here as a Clear Creek family and <clears throat> just fellowship and worship together. Father, thank you for this great time of worship we have had, and may it have been a pleasing aroma to you. And Father, as we go into the preaching and study of your word, I pray that our posture is still that of worship, Father, that we, we kneel before you and with our hearts and minds just open to hear what you have for us today. Uh, Father, please just clear my mind, Father. Give me the boldest to preach, the words to speak, Father. May this all be about you. And making you known. Father, I ask all these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. <clears throat> so while Christians in the United States have yet to experience what I would call legitimate persecution, such as the first century believers faced, I think it would be just ignorant of us to say there is not a growing animosity and hatred or bitterness towards that of Christianity in our nation. Would you agree? Um, Just from from your neighbor, uh, from the government, from just a general consensus, there is a growing resistance and intolerance to Christianity spreading like a cancer in this country. Uh, Every time I hop on social media or I get online, there's another scathing article denouncing the beliefs and the practices of Christianity or uh, someone else accusing Christians of being hypocritical or hateful. Now, while the latter actually might be true, overall, Christianity, Christians in our nation are facing more unique problems than we have previously in this climate. And we have to ask ourselves, what do we do in this situation? How do we respond when we face this this animosity, when we face this uh, hatred towards Christianity? Because again, we're not really to the persecution stage. And by the way, I know it's finals week for seniors and finals week for everybody else. I just want to throw this out there. Writing those papers and those tests aren't persecution either. In case you're trying to relate a little bit educationally to that, that's not what we're talking about. You can do it, kids. Keep going. Um, But what I'm talking about is legitimate persecution, legitimate hatred and animosity. We have to ask ourselves, how How do we react to this situation? Well, thankfully, folks, the Bible does not leave us empty handed. The Bible does not leave us without an answer. As we navigate through the darkness, it tells us about a light. Actually, furthermore, it tells us about the light, the light of the world that is Jesus Christ. You see, these questions have been posed before, and the Bible provides us an answer. And in 1 Peter, uh, Peter is writing to an audience who is experiencing legitimate persecution. They have been spread out throughout the region, and now they are actually facing uh, imprisonment. They are facing social ostracization, and some of them are facing even death due to their faith. And under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Peter writes to these wearied and troubled believers and reminds them of the greatest truth that they have, and that is their hope in Jesus Christ. And as we go into verse 13, Peter has just concluded talking about their living hope and how they have an inheritance waiting for them on the other side of eternity, one that is imperishable. It will not decay. It will not experience rust. It is guarded for them by God himself. And now he goes into verse 13 and he reminds us of two great truths that we're going to talk about today. If you were to look in verse 13 with me, we'll talk about this first truth. This first truth is this. We need the call to holiness reiterated in our lives. If we're going to have the response that a redeemed person should have in the face of animosity, in the face of persecution, we need the call to holiness reiterated in our lives. So after discussing the hope that believers have in Jesus Christ, we begin in verse 13 with the word, therefore. Let's just get hermeneutics 101 out the way. When we see the word, therefore, what do we do? What do we ask? What is it? 
Therefore, you all passed this semester of hermeneutics. I said so. Dr. Smith, write it down. All right? <laughs> therefore. So he's saying, because of the hope that you have in Christ Jesus, therefore, leads him into his next thought. In verse 13, he says, therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, as we look at that phrase, minds ready for action, perhaps you have a translation that says to gird up your loins. And as you guys know, you're educated Bible college student. This is a figure of speech that they would very well understand. You understand that back in the day that these that men would wear these long outer robes and they would get in the way of daily activities. And so therefore, they would have to tie their robes together, tie them like a rope together around their waist to clear the distractions, clear the hindrances from them being able to do the work that they are supposed to do in any given day. Peter is taking this physical uh, illustration and applying it into the intellectual and the spiritual mind of the believer. He's getting their attention saying, hey, listen up right now because of the hope. Therefore, you need to pay attention. All right, clear yourself of all distractions, clear yourself of the hindrances that are keeping you from listening to what I'm about to tell you and focus on this one thing. He tells them to be sober minded or serious, meaning to keep a level head. And he then urges them to have their hopes set completely upon the grace to be brought to them at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, clear your minds, get ready, focus on this. You need to understand there's a hope that you have. I know things are hard right now. I know you're facing persecution. I know life has not turned out the way that you want it to be, but get this, something's coming. All right, this is not the end for you. He's reminding them about their eschatologically driven ethics. He's reminding them that they got to have one eye on the future so they do not get bogged down in the present. Peter's reminded his audience of what is to come. As discussed, again, they were facing persecution, and Peter's reminding them that their hope does not lie within themselves. Oh, no, friends, your hope does not rely upon your circumstances. If your hope relies on your circumstances, oh, man, will you ever have have hope. I don't know about you, but something bad happens to me every single day. All right? I wake up and it's just a bad day. So thank the Lord that my hope is not found within me. Thank the Lord my hope is not found within the things going on around me. But what I can rest my, my hope upon is that I have an assured confidence, a blessed assurance, if you will, that there is something better coming towards me. And that is the hope that I have in Jesus Christ, who earlier in chapter 1, is a living hope that he now guards our inheritance that is imperishable. Oh, folks, what a blessing we have in him. And he reminds them that they can draw confidence from the always available divine grace that has been afforded to them in Christ Jesus. And as he moves on to verse 14, you see a natural progression here. Since they're sober-minded, since they've set aside those hindrances, in verse 14, they're now ready, as he says, to be as obedient children and to not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. And the one commentator notes that as obedient children imitate the life of the father that they love, so these children of God were to emulate the character of their father. I don't know about you, when I was a child, I thought my dad was the coolest person on the face of the planet. <laughs> now, my dad and I, our relationship has gone up and down throughout the years, and we're not always as close, but I always love him. He always loves me. Now, when I was a child, I remember my dad was, a, he's always been a mechanic, a machinist. Now he's more into welding and fabrication, but he's a man's man. <laughs> and so he would always have these old beat up trucks that he would work on. And I remember he had a Ford Bronco, and I loved that thing. It was blue, and I, I, I love the old Broncos. I love the body style and everything on them, and it was stick shift. And uh, my dad got a kick out of this one day. He's driving, and he's shifting gears and everything, and I'm sitting in the passenger seat right next to him, and I just start shifting a gear with him. 
And he kind of looked over at me, looked at me weird. He didn't know what I was doing at first. And he shift gears and I would shift gears. And he just got the biggest kick out of that because I, as his son, was trying to copy him. I, I was watching my father. I wanted to be like him. We were on my way to my grandma's house and he told my grandma about it all. He just got a kick out of it, just seeing his son trying to be like him. You see, that's the same attitude that Peter is telling us to have when it comes to our heavenly father is that we are not meant to act as our own, as a, is in our previous ways before Christ. We now are obedient children conforming to the way of our Lord and Savior. Uh, chapter 1 verse 2 talks about how we have been set apart by the Spirit for obedience and therefore we're to adopt the characteristics of our Heavenly Father just as we do with our earthly Father. Now as he continues in this verse, he talks about how we're not to conform to our previous way of life. Now that word conform there has this idea being related to the setting or a scheme or a system of life. Now freely rendered, it means to not schematize your conduct according to the passions of your former ignorance. Hey, can I tell you a great truth this morning? You're not who you were before Jesus. Aren't you glad about that? I'm not who I was before Jesus. And I thank the Lord for that. You know what I was before Jesus? I was a punk. All right. I was a punk. All right. I was a pornographer. I was, uh, I was a blasphemer. I had the worst sailor's mouth you could ever find before Jesus. Uh, I was someone who disrespected my father day in and day out when we were on the lows instead of the highs of our relationship. Can I tell you, thank God today, I'm not a sinner who is destined for hell anymore. You see, I now belong to somebody and I belong to him. I don't have to conform to those former ways of ignorance. And that's not who I am anymore, folks. Folks, I am blood bought and redeemed by Jesus Christ. And now I can stand when God looks at me. He no longer sees me drenched in the stain of my sin. He sees the shed blood of Christ that has been poured over me. He now sees Jesus Christ in my place. And I don't have to worry about those former ways of ignorance anymore. That's not who I am anymore. The old man was crucified as Christ. And now Christ lives in me, folks. Uh, Peter is stating here that these believers, just as we are, we're now to live as born again Christians in a world that would rather we not. He said they would have to resist conformity with the world by being obedient to Jesus. Uh, the Holman Bible handbook states that Christians would show their response to God's holiness by leaving the evil desires of their past ignorance and by adopting God's own behavior as their pattern. You see, he, he wanted them to understand and we need to understand as well today <clears throat> as children of God, we now are no longer what we were. And now we live in obedience to the one who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous lights. And as we progress into verses 15 and 16, uh, he talks about the model for this obedience. You know what the model is? Uh, the model is God. It's holiness, moral perfection. As we look into verse 15, he says, but as the one who called you is holy, you are also to be holy in all of your conduct. Into verse 16, for it is written, be holy because I am am holy, a reference to several passages in the book of Leviticus. See, Peter is stressing here that holiness is not just avoiding doing bad things. Yeah, I think we kind of miss uh, an element of, of what holiness actually is. You see, holiness is not just don'ts. Holiness is actually also do. It's one thing to avoid bad things, but you see, our holiness has to be directed upon something. And what is it directed upon? Well, the standard for perfection, and that is our Father, God in heaven. You see, holiness is incomplete if it only consists of avoiding the world or certain patterns of behavior. Holiness must first and foremost be directed to an object. What is that object? God. And even amongst the situation, the persecution that these first century believers were facing, Peter exhorted them to this task. Why? Because God has already set the standard. You see, folks, uh, there is a standard upon which we must live. And I am so fearful today that so often when it comes to our sanctification, when it comes to our holiness, we settle for mediocrity. <laughs> we say if we can just be just good enough, if we can be a little bit better than that person sitting in the pew, 
next to us. We can be just a little bit better than the people we pass by on the road. If we can be just holy enough, then we'll make it. Oh, folks, uh, the standard is excellence. Uh, the Lord does not ask any less of us. Now, of course, there's this tension. We know we cannot be perfect. Do not hear what I am not saying. I'm not saying you strive for sinless perfectionism. While we have been redeemed by Christ, we still wrestle with this body of flesh. But can I tell you, there must always be this constant tension going where we are constantly striving to conform to our Savior and Lord in his example. Hear me, friends. The child of God must never be comfortable with second-rate holiness. Amen. Folks, he says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. We do not settle. I love what Dr. Mark Tolbert said when he was here on our campus during Inauguration Day. He said, there's no premium on mediocrity. Uh, folks, don't be, don't be a second-class citizen of heaven. You're first class. You need to act like it. All right? Uh, strive to reach the goal. And as after he extends this call to holiness, Peter continues on to remind them about their motivation for this righteous conduct. It's their father and their judge. In verse 17, if you appeal to the father who judges impartially according to each one's work, you are to conduct yourselves in reverence during your time living as strangers. Perhaps your translation references the word fear instead of reverence. And we understand you guys are good students of hermeneutics. You know your Old Testament terminology. You know when there's any mention of the fear of the Lord. It is not a shaking in your boots. Oh no, was he going to zap me today because I was not good enough? No, 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 no. It's this reverential awe that we get to bask in the glory of our Lord and Savior. And as he's saying here, to work in reverence, to conduct in reverence, we get to stand back in awe of the amazing responsibility at the pursuit of holiness. I don't know about you guys, but for me, life can be so difficult sometimes. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I, I do wake up every morning and I ask the question, what is going to go wrong today? A lot of times. I know I shouldn't. I know it's not the right attitude, but that's just, that's just my flesh. I, I fight that daily, but I fully expect at least once a month some kind of catastrophe uh, to attack my household. There's a running joke with uh, Dr. Smith and, and Jared with, with my vehicles. At least once a month, I get a flat tire. We're, we just kind of just wait. Like, is it the 15th? Yep, there goes the tire. I mean, it's just something that happens to us. Life just comes at you fast. Just two weeks ago, halfway to Tennessee to visit my family for my my nephew's second birthday, my transmission goes out <laughs> in my truck. Right as we're going on the interstate and I'm having to drive 30 miles an hour, people are zooming by me. And let me tell you something, I hate being that guy. I hate being the guy on the interstate going 30, 35 when everyone's zooming by me going 80. Because when I'm on the interstate, I'm, a, I'm in a race, all right? I'm beating everybody around me, and I'm beating the GPS. And so far, GPS has not won until that last Saturday. But I, there are just so many things. Now, those, those are superficial things, but there's so many things that I struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis. Folks, life is just hard. There are things I pray to God for that, uh, that are just not happening. Uh, I deal with just all these different situations coming up in my life. And sometimes I don't know if it's going to get any better. But in, the, in those moments, my flesh rises up. Can I tell you, it would be so easy. It's so easy for us to just shake our fists just to the sky and just, just speak ill of the Lord. It would be so easy for me to fly off the handle the next time someone just pushes me just a little bit too far. But you see, but in those moments, I'm reminded of something, I'm reminded of these words, be holy for I am holy. <laughs> Folks, as these, as these Christians were living in persecution, as these folks were living in trying times, and just as we are living in our day and age, there's too much at stake for us to give in to our flesh. There's way too much at stake. You see, we are called to be ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. You might be the only Bible someone ever meets. You might be the only spiritual Christian influence someone might meet. There's too much at stake for us to give in to the flesh. And I cannot afford to let my situation get the best of me and thereby become a stumbling block to those around me or even myself. And if we're all honest, folks, we're all a little bit like this. I know it's not just me. 
Uh, I know it's not just me. You may be saying, oh, never me. I never let the situation get the better of me. I, I am holy as holy gets. You know, David thought that too. <laughs> you guys think you're better than David? Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. I don't think I've ever heard any scripture talk about you like that. Oh, folks, we need holiness in our day and age. We need that call reiterated in our lives. And I want to say this before I move on, especially to those of my, my brothers who are going to stand in a pulpit, whether you're a senior pastor, student pastor, associate, whatever you may be doing, I want to make sure we understand this. If a man is not called to the standard of holiness, then certainly he is not called to the study of homiletics. Oh, how quick we are to preach, but how slow we are to repent. Oh, folks, folks, I am sick and tired of reading another article about another man whose life has gone astray. I'm so sick and tired of hearing about another affair coming out of uh, large churches. I'm so sick and tired of uh, hearing about those things in our day and age. But you know what we could do? If we could reiterate the call to holiness in our lives and be committed to what God has commanded us to do in this word, folks, maybe we can turn the tide. And maybe we won't have to read another article like that in a little while. Don't you think? Uh, folks, if we're not called to the standard of holiness, we're not called to the study of homiletics, my brother. We are not. See, folks, we need the call to holiness reiterated in our lives. <clears throat> now, once we do that, uh, I, I believe how we can do that is what Paul rem or Peter reminds us about in verses 18 through 21. This is my second point today. We need to recall how we came to hope in Christ. We need to call, recall how we came to hope in Christ Jesus. He reminds them about who their hope is founded upon. Once more, it is Jesus Christ. And he reminds them about this very, very important fact. They are redeemed. They are redeemed. Look with me in verse 18. He says, For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, into verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless Lamb. You see, this word redeemed will be familiar to them in this day. And as good students of the Bible, I'm sure you know this. But just to reiterate the point, you know that that word redeemed is an ancient slave trade term and has this idea of a slave being freed by someone paying the price for their life. And now Peter takes that uh, earthly uh, illustration and makes it an eternal type of illustration. And he talks about how the payment that released Christians from an empty way of life was this, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And folks, uh, our payment was not something that we originated within ourselves. Uh, we could not buy our way out of sin. You cannot buy your way into heaven. You see, what was found within us in verse 18 says, we had an empty way of life. Uh, folks, I, this may offend some of your delicate sensibilities, but I'm just going to let you know, uh, there ain't nothing special in you that warranted the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, folks, we are sinners. Uh, there's this movement going around today that talks about how you are worthy, you are enough, and you deserve it all. Folks, we don't deserve anything. Can I quote Dr. Helton for you? Dr. Helton said, we deserve nothing short of death, torment, and an eternity in hell. You see, folks, we had an empty way of life. Uh, there was nothing in us that made us worth saving, but that's what makes the gospel so glorious. The gospel sees us drenched in sin on our best day. We are like filthy rags, but yet God saw us in our sin and said, you know what? I'm going to save them because I love them. Amen. Nothing that they've done, but because of who I am. See, we had an empty way of life. Uh, just as they were in bondage to sin, so were we. No way of paying the ransom because the cost was too high. And surely Peter's audience would marvel once more when Peter reminded them of the cost of their ransom at the very blood of Jesus Christ, the spotless and perfect lamb, way more precious than earthly things such as silver and that of gold. You see, folks, I think what provided even more comfort as well as we go into uh, verse 20 and 21, he says this, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you, for you. Through him you believe in God and raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Hey, get this, folks. Redemption was never a backup plan. 
I want, I want us to, to really settle on that fact. You see, uh, the cross of Christ was not an afterthought. <laughs> it did not catch God by surprise, uh, folks. This was not a last-minute idea. It was not a fluke. It was not a happening of chance. And it was no remedy for an unseen evil devised at the time of its happening. You see, God has always had a plan. And folks, if, if the cross of Christ was foreknown before the very foundations of the world, if he had this plan in place for us, do you think now that he's still able to sustain you? I think so. I think if the gospel is powerful enough to save us, the gospel is powerful enough to sustain us. And that is the confidence upon which we place our hope. For these believers living in a time of scattered persecution, this truth must have given them solace. It must have given them peace and hope, allowing for them to know that the same Lord that saved them is the same Lord that has put everything into motion before the foundation of the world, and he still has them in his hands. Folks, what a motivator to pursue a holy lifestyle. I can't think of anything greater, knowing that for the foundations of the world, God had a plan for my life. And as we close out the section, Peter uh, reminds them about the God and who they believe, how he was, he was raised from the dead and he was glorified at his ascension. Now we understand here that God purposed that people would put their faith and hope in him as a result of Christ's resurrection in that living Hope, Folks, as, as we go throughout our lives and as the highs and the lows hit and as we face hatred, bitterness, persecution, whatever it may be, uh, Shriner reminds us that the readers, again, would understand that the holy life in which they are called is a life in which they are trusting God's promises. That was all they had. And guess what? It's all we have today, too. We have nothing else besides the promises of God. <laughs> You know, I, I love Christmas. Does anybody know that? No, oh, yeah, do you? Oh, okay. Uh, I love Christmas. I'm the type of guy that I start listening to Christmas music in November, November 1. It's what I do. If I could convince Dr. Smith, we'd sing Christmas songs in October, just to be honest with you. But he is a Grinch. He is a bah humbug kind of guy. And um, he just, I don't know what about sweet baby Jesus bothers him. Um, <clears throat> but I love Christmas. I'm, I love the guy. I hope you all know that. Um, I love Christmas. I love the joy that it brings. I love the music. I love gathering with family. Uh, I love everything about Christmas. You know what else I do like? I'll, I'll just be a little uh, fleshly. I also like getting presents. Anybody else? Be honest. You like getting presents. Don't lie to me. You're lying to God too. All right. All right. I love getting presents. I do. <clears throat> do you remember as a child how excited you were on Christmas morning? When you got that present, and then throughout the week, you were just so excited about it. I mean, it just made your day. Where, where was that toy three months later? You don't know. You, if it had noise, your parents probably threw it away. I feel that right now. I understand. I'm, I, I understand my parents a little bit more and how some of my toys just magically disappeared. <laughs> I, I get that now. But folks, uh, just as we lose interest and we lose the awe, of something as trivial as a Christmas present, sometimes I think we lose interest and we lose the awe of things of the spiritual persuasion as well. Folks, when is the last time you recalled and marveled at the gospel of Jesus Christ? When is the last time you, you, you stopped <coughs> and recognized that your life is not your own? That your life is not your own. See, folks, the best thing that I can do for myself and that you can do for yourself is in tough situations to remember that my life is not my own and your life is not your own. You see, we had to be bought back from sin with a price because, again, we couldn't pay it. Only person who could pay that price was Jesus Christ himself. Folks, I want you to understand this. We were lost, dying, and heading straight to hell. That's who we were, all right? We are the kind, we, are, we as people see all that God has given us, all of the general revelation that we have in the world to tell us there is a God. And just as we look at that and we see that, we take all the blessings that God has given us, we ball it up, we crumple it up, throw it in his face and spit on it and say, we can do it better ourselves. I am my own 
God. And again, God looked at us like that. I mean, can you, I mean, I don't think you guys are getting as excited as you need to be. God saved us, folks. We were on our way to hell. He saw us in our sin, saw us these filthy rags that we are not deserving salvation, not deserving eternal reward. And he says, I'm going to send my one and only son to save these people who do not deserve it simply because that's the kind of God that I am. When is the last time you marveled at that truth? I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty of losing the wonder of the cross. But I remember a quote from Dr. John in one of my Old Testament classes when I first got here. He says, sin had a heavy penalty and it was paid on the cross. You never lose that wonder. Oh, folks, we need to recall the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Because of that, we belong to God. We're in the family of God. We're co-heirs with Christ. And I have a certainty that no matter what happens, there's something waiting for me on the other side. There's something waiting for me. I know that I don't have, my hope is not wishful thinking. And my hope is blessed assurance. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We all, young, old, man, woman, child, pastor, deacon, layman, missionary, whatever you may be, we need to be reminded of what Christ has done for us. We need to preach the gospel to ourselves daily. See, the gospel is not just for that moment of salvation, folks. No, the gospel is for life. The gospel gives our life meaning. The gospel is what fulfills our purpose. And the gospel is the very thing in which we must live. Uh, I close with this question. What will your response be when things get tough? Will you reiterate the call to holiness in your life? And you will recall the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for this day that you have given us. Thank you for the time that we've been able to come together and just open up your word, Father. And Father, I pray through all the, the slurring and stumbling of words, Father, that you have been made great today. Father, as we leave this place, I hope we understand that we are ambassadors for your sake. Father, as we leave this place, I pray that we take with us the word that was preached today. May we live a holy lifestyle, Father, always dwelling upon what you have done for us. I pray for every student as we're closing out the end of this semester, Father. May they finish strong. May our professors finish strong, Father. And may we make much of you in our conduct. It's in your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen.